Hello, everybody, and welcome to our somewhat expanded division directors meeting today uh, for a special a special event. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, we're hosting, as you know, a special speaker this morning to talk about uh, his very successful work in attracting and retaining a diverse student population for STEM programs. Before I introduce him, I'll I'll do what would usually be the introduction for our meeting and say our leadership changes taking place this week. So first of all, we have a this is uh, Lori Chirpel, our new chief financial officer, is now on board. And uh, uh, of course, our very own Aditi Chakravarti has now begun serving in her new role as chief culture officer, reporting to me. And finally, please welcome back Lady Ito, who is resuming her role as chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer after spending two years uh, uh, getting things in shape at the DOE headquarters uh, on, on leave there. So uh, that these are uh, all very important people for us. So uh, welcome and welcome back. So now for the main event. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Summers, who's the Robert E. Meyerhoff Chair for Excellence in Research and Mentoring at UMBC, University of Maryland at Baltimore County. We talked quite a bit about the larger successes UMBC at the National Academies meeting in April, and I sort of contacted Michael to see if he'd be willing to come to us and talk a little bit about this important story. I, I knew that we would find it both interesting and relevant to what we are trying to do. Uh, so quickly, as a distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry and an HHMI investigator, his research efforts are aimed at understanding how HIV-1 and other retroviruses assemble in infected cells. And his uh, it, work has been widely recognized. Of course, he's, uh, he's, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of AAAS. Uh, he's won the NIH Merit Award for his studies and uh, uh, and he was given the Ruth Kirchstein Award of the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Relevant to what we're talking about here, he won the AAAS Mentorship Award in 2003 and received a White House Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, Engineering, and Mentoring in, in 2000. So he'll be talking about that great science later today, but this morning we'll focus on his work with the Meyerhoff Scholars Program and more generally, uh, as many of you know, this program is regarded as, a, as a really a transformational change in how we do this and fostering uh, well, diversity in the sciences. It has uh, similar programs that have been copied from that all over the country. Uh, and uh, he began working with that program soon after he arrived at UMBC. Um, and, and he has said that the most important meaningful work he has done throughout his career is centered around the Meyerhoff program. So with that background, I'd just like it to turn it over to Michael and tell us what he has learned over the last few years. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. I'm really happy to be doing this. Um, basically, I'm going to be telling you about work that, that we started in 1987 when both Freeman and I started at UMBC. Freeman Hrabowski is the former president of UMBC. He just retired one year ago. And so all of the things that I'm doing now and all of the things that the campus has done uh, are really a reflection of his vision. And so let me just go ahead and get um, started. So just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure you already know these statistics, but uh, this was published in the New York Times about uh, five years ago, I guess. Um, and what it showed is the change in the gap in um, uh, enrollment of Hispanics in this case at uh, the top 100 private and public universities. So this is college enrollment and this is national population. And you can see the gap has, has grown significantly from 80 to 2015. And if and the Times also looked at black college enrollments in the same institutions, and you can see the gap grew a bit for blacks as well. There's been some increase in um, enrollment, and uh, but but not much. This is interesting because it led the New York Times to conclude that affirmative action hasn't worked because this is during the, a period of affirmative action around the country, which was kind of a surprise to hear that that was a conclusion from the Times. African-American education in the US, this is what we've paid more attention to at UMBC, um, is shown here. You can see that uh, several years ago, and I made up this slide, and it hasn't changed much since then, about 12% of college, uh, enrolled college students are African-American, 
about eight and a half to nine percent of bachelor's degrees are earned by African Americans, but only uh, less than still less than three percent of science engineering PhDs are awarded to African Americans. Um, why do we need to care about diversity? Obviously, you're here because you already do care, but uh, this is a talk I, I give every time I give a science talk, people want to hear about our inclusion work. So a lot of people don't know these statistics. It, just if you look at the uh, population in the U.S., of course, you already know in California, Caucasians make up uh, less than half the California population. But if you look nationwide in, in 2010, Caucasians made up about 65% of the U.S. population by 2050 uh, Caucasians would be less half the uh, less than half the population. So, I mean, one of the reasons we, as educators, we need to care about who our students are that we're educating. These should be people that make up the population of our country, and we need to make sure that that we're that we're educating all the the people. And health disparities is a big uh, motivator for me. This is Shardell Hawkins. Uh, she started as a, an undergraduate in the lab. She went to a historically black college on the Eastern shore of Maryland, came and did summer research, got excited about it. So she came and joined my lab as a PhD student. This is a photo at her wedding, but three months prior to her wedding, she had her candidacy exam. And uh, the candidacy exam, as you all know, it's a high stress exam. There are about five or six faculty at the exam and they pepper her with questions. She'd already finished all her classes. She had uh, almost straight A's in all of her graduate classes. Uh, she did uh, really well on her exam. Now, you know, um, at these exams, usually students bring donuts or something for the for the committee. You know, it's kind of a bribe. Shardell's dad was a chef for the National Library of Congress. And so she brought a tray of oysters and shrimp and all kinds of things. So uh, she obviously passed, no problems. Uh, but uh, three months after her candidacy exam was her wedding and halfway between that, so one and a half months after her candidacy exam, uh, Shardell's father passed away. Now, uh, Shardell and her younger siblings were all raised by her dad. He was a tall, thin man like Shardell. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke. The only thing that he had going against him statistically was the color of his skin and he was still in his 40s. Uh, this is Lamont Tolliver. He ran the Meyerhoff undergraduate program I'll be telling you about for 15 years. Uh, he was on his way to my office to discuss how we could help other universities replicate our program and our outcomes. And he called me and said he was running late. He'd be there in a second. He collapsed right outside my office and uh, we performed CPR for 25 minutes and were unable to resuscitate him. He also, he was 48 years old. And so this is what we tell high school students when they are coming to campus to learn about education at UMBC. We tell them and their parents. Basically, we invite high achieving Blacks and high achieving Hispanics, and, and we, we try to reach out to people to make them know and their parents know that we're, we're a place that care about them. And I, and I talk to the, to the students and their parents, and, and I tell them at our evening address, I say, look at your dad. If, if your, if your dad is black, then he has a 30% higher chance of, of dying of heart disease than his white friends do. And it's the same for your mom. Uh, diabetes, one in four African-American women over 55 has diabetes. Lupus is threefold higher in African-American women. And this was published less than 10 years ago in science that uh, black men typically live five and a half years, fewer years than their white friends. So, um, not only do we have health disparities, but these are data that were just published earlier this year by the NIH. This is looking at who's getting funding from the uh, NIH. And uh, this shows a number of uh, you know research program project applicants, uh, black applicants starting in 2010, and it's below 800. And then by 2020, it was above 1,200. And so there has been an increase. And then if you look at the awardees, it's a little over 100 to around 300. So you might think that those trends are good. But then if you look at the overall numbers, they're very, very small. So the black, uh, the black recipients are in this uh, pink color. You can see they're at the very bottom compared to uh, other groups. And in fact, uh, less than 2% of all NIH R01s go to black PIs. So, you know, why aren't more minority students earning science PhDs? And the common answers I always get is, 
from my white friends is that there aren't many who are interested in science and math and the smart ones all go to medical school. And those data, those presumptions are just, uh, they, they don't hold water. If you go to the college board, you'll see for more than 20 years, similar percentages of blacks and Caucasian fresh, freshmen aspire to a science degree when they start college. And in our Meyerhoff program, I'll be telling you about is a strengths-based program Students typically have already had calculus. They have had AP classes uh, in order to get in. They have to be nominated to get in. So as a strengths-based program, my friends are usually surprised to learn that we get more than 2,500 nominations every year and more than 200 completed applications from minority students. More than 80% of them are from Maryland. And so more than 200 completed applicants for a strengths-based program and for about 45 uh, freshman slots for minority students, because the program supports not just minorities, but also majority students. So with these numbers and these data that have been around for a long time, the only thing you can really conclude is that there are large numbers of talented minority students in high school and, and early in college who are interested in STEM, and we're just doing a poor job of retaining them. So then you might say, well, why are we, you know, why are so few retained? And I think a huge factor is low expectations. And I want to tell you just really briefly about Christy Pullen. She was a Meyerhoff undergraduate, one of the early ones in my lab. She published two papers with me as an undergraduate. She went to Berkeley for her PhD. She worked with Tom Albert, published a beautiful protein crystal structure. Um, so I was organizing a Keystone meeting and I invited her to give a talk. Actually, she and Bill Clemens were the first blacks to ever speak at this Keystone meeting on frontiers in structural biology. Um, and Christy just gave a phenomenal talk and uh, everybody was coming up to me asking me if she was my student and everything. <laughs> she got to the airport and sent me an email and said she said it was really depressing because she wasn't getting help when she got to the seminar room and the and the other speakers were all getting help. And then, then the other speakers started asking her how the lights worked and how the timing worked. And then one person, one of the speakers looked at her and looked at her badge and said, oh, you're Christy Pullen. I thought you were the projectionist. And she said that even though people were saying to her, you gave a great talk in the back of her mind, she felt like they were saying, you gave a great talk. We just didn't expect that to come from a black scientist. And I think that's something she'd been hearing all her life. And then I had a senior colleague who, who was very much against the Meyerhoff program when it was started. And, and we started arguing about it. And he, he said that he, he also, he was actually went to graduate school at Berkeley in the 60s. He said he, he was the most liberal person you will ever meet. He'd never voted for a Republican in his life, but he said it's, he doesn't think it's fair to do something for any group based on race or gender. Everybody should be treated the same. So uh, the same senior colleague was at dinner with, a, uh, with me and some friends. Uh, we had a uh, visitor, a chemistry visitor came and gave a seminar. And the same senior guy was talking about the Meyerhoff program and telling the visitor about it. This is about four years after we started the program. And what he told the visitor surprised me. He said, prior to the Meyerhoff program, if there was a black student in his upper level chemistry class, they sat in the back, they didn't ask questions. And if they earned a C, he'd write a strong letter. Now he said there are large numbers. They sit in the front of the class. They ask questions, and if one of the, typically one of them sets the high grade on the exam, and he said now if a student black student earns a C, he calls them into his office to figure out what the problem is. And I don't even know if he heard himself say that, but it shows the change that occurred. It was just a great illustration in my mind of the change in all of us that happened when we started seeing large numbers of high achievers in the front row in a very visible way, doing well in our classes. It changed the way the faculty thought. It changed the way the black students in our campus thought about science education, those that weren't in the program, but they'd see these students doing well. And it had the similar effect on the white students. So I think the real issue is that there's this negative drumbeat that, and it's that they hear from an early age that they don't belong in science. And it's exacerbated by recent news that we're, we're producing too many PhDs in the US, although you don't hear that too much the, in the last few years. There's this Ginther article that, that created a lot of, of problems, I think, that's, that showed that Blacks are not competing for NIH grants. And then another paper that came out in science that said that's because they choose uninteresting uh, research topics. So, you know, if 
if you're a bl smart black student and you're interested in science and you you're you're getting all this information it's not surprising that that they may not want to stay in this area so uh, climate really changed at UMBC and it's it's all due to Freeman Hrabowski uh, in 1987, when he and I started, uh, black students were holding sit-ins because the campus was perceived as racist. It's not like this had a great reputation when this all started. But now we're the top school of origin of black MD PhDs. We have been for many, many years, more than 10 years. Uh, we're also now, just as of a couple of years ago, the top school of origin of black STEM PhDs. We've surpassed Howard University and, and other minority-only institutions. And we're considered a, a role model for inclusive excellence. Uh, Freeman Herbowski earlier this year won the uh, National Academy uh, of Sciences Public Welfare Medal. This is the highest award given by the Academy. It's the only award that comes with uh, membership in the National Academy. So what is the Meyerhoff program and, and how does it work? <clears throat> it was started in 1989. It initially only supported African-American males because it was started with a donation from uh, Bob Meyerhoff, a Baltimore philanthropist, um, and he was worried about the plight of, of young black men in Baltimore. Uh, it was opened up a year later to black men and women, and as more federal money came in and as, uh, and as policies around the country changed, uh, it was opened up to all students who care about issues of inclusion. And by care, that's just not a, a, a paragraph that they write. They have to be involved in all the activities that, that, the, that are entailed by being in this program. So it tends to be self-selective for majority students, which are you know, white and Asian students on our campus, um, who really do care about um, social justice and inclusion in STEM. So historically now, about 71% of our students are, are underrepresented minority. Most of them are African-American just because of the history of the program. And about 15% Caucasian and another 14 or 15% are Asian. Uh, it's a student-centered approach. We go after high achievers in high school. We provide intrusive support, intrusive support with very high expectations. Uh, it's a cohort learning model. <clears throat> and what happens is a student come in, come in uh, during our summer bridge. We have a six-week summer bridge where the students um, learn how to work together in teams and to support each other. Um, give you a quick example of, of how one aspect of it works. The students in a, in a cohort might be between 50 to 70 students. They all have to wear name tags with their major and they can't take the name tags off until they all know each other you know, uh, visually. And then um, they all uh, take a math class in the summer and this goes on their transcripts. So it's a four grades math class and it's a calculus course. And so they, it's a, basically it's cramming all of calculus into six weeks and the students are told to self-select into groups of four and study as a team and as individuals. And then they take their first quizzes as individuals, but then the team, the group of four gets the average grade of the group. What's even more important is that the entire class gets the grade of the weakest group. So think about that for a minute. So now what happens is after the first quiz, students are allowed to reorganize one time. And so what they do is those that are strongest in math and calculus, they look for the students who need the most help, those with less uh, preparation. So you know what it's like usually if you ask students to work in group, the well-prepared kids get together and the other students are left on their own to try to figure things out. This is a model where we try to get students who need help to seek help and get students who have more experience to look for those that need help because this way they all benefit. And then immersion in research, we want students to really focus on their classes their first semester, and then they get heavily involved in research the summer after their freshman year. And then a key point is high exposure. So if we have a cohort of let's say uh, 70 students of which maybe 50 are black, we try to make sure that they are all in the same sections of those, fresh, you know, those large freshman courses like physics and, and chemistry. And then we want them in the front row of the classes, you know, 10 minutes before class starts. So what happens is if you're a faculty member like me, you walk into class a little early to get set up and you see 25 kids shoulder to shoulder in the front row, you naturally start having conversations with them. You start to know who they are. You, you start lecturing and they start raising their hand. That exposure goes a huge way to changing expectations of the faculty. 
Now, this is a picture of my lab. I have a lot of undergraduates in my group. Typically, I have about um, six or seven PhD students and two or three postdocs and about 20 or so undergraduates. And then in the summer, we do outreach work. So I bring in about seven inner city high school students. And I just like showing this because Freeman Herbowski, this was his last day as president, and he came over for a photo. And you can see we're all wearing Freeman Herbowski t-shirts, and that reflects the new HHMI program that was started. HHMI has put more than a billion and a half dollars, that's billion with a B, into, into inclusion programs. And this is one that supports early career faculty who are going to do exceptional science in an inclusive and build an inclusive environment. So just to show you, our numbers really are high. This is one given year. We had, you know, 2,000, more than 2,000 nominations. We had uh, about 400 in-state applications and about 86 out-of-state applications. Uh, you know, half male, half female. We really work hard to reach out to the male applicants, especially the uh, black male applicants to try to get these numbers to be similar. Um, ethnicity, you can see we had 168 African-Americans, 151 Caucasians who applied. Um, and then if you look at the graduation plans, 255 said they want to do a PhD and another 60 MD PhD. A lot of them said they wanted to go to medical school. But then if you look at those that we bring in for selection weekend, where we interview them out of those 157, we only brought in 10. We only made offers to five. We ended up with three. You can see we're really looking for students who want to be researchers. We want people who are going to be at the head of the classroom rather than, you know, in an office in a, in a clinical setting. And, um, you know, the GPAs are good. These are the average GPAs of all of the students, the average GPAs we brought in for selection weekend. And then these are the, this is our class. And just to give you an example, you know, this is that out of that same group, this is one student who we brought in. He had a GPA of 4.0 out of high school. He had all these AP classes. This, I, I put this slide up because I was giving a talk at HHMI and there was a university uh, president who uh, was talking to me and, and this president said, well, we could never do Meyerhoff at our prestigious Northeastern University because the black students just can't compete with the white students. So I put this slide together so I could show her. And this is a student from her state who we recruited to our program. He, he transferred into UMBC with 41 AP credits in STEM. Uh, he had won awards at Temple, eighth grade. He already won a science award. Uh, he won awards, you know, first place in a in a New Jersey uh, Merck Science Day, seventh place in a New Jersey Science League test. I mean, this is a brilliant guy. He placed into Calculus three. He won all kinds of awards at UMBC, and he did his uh, went to Hopkins for his MD PhD. Now, this is the exceptional student. Uh, other students who we also take into the program had a, still a decent high school GPA, but it only had pre-calc, hadn't had calculus. AP biology, AP chemistry, the SATs were below expectations. Uh, uh, nevertheless, she got in, she ended up graduating with a 3.58 and did her PhD at UPenn. Uh, would she have been retained in science if she wasn't part of a cohort with somebody like this? I don't know, but it does show how, how groups like this can really support each other and um, lead to um, uh, good outcomes for everybody. So our outcomes, We've had uh, about 1,500 participants, 71% minority. We've had more than 1,150 graduates. 91% of them were retained in STEM. It's pretty amazing since they they started when they're 17 years old. We've had, but when they started, they were all telling us, "I want to be a scientist too." We've had 930 pursue graduate or professional degrees and 312 PhDs awarded. 59 MD PhDs, and you can see the number of masters, and there are quite a few that are still in graduate school. So we really are having an impact on the, especially the black students who are going on to earn PhDs in STEM. Now, you know, we've been criticized, and people have said, well, you're picking the cream of the crop. Of course, they're going to do well. So one of the smart things that Freeman did when he started the program is when we, and when we invite students and their parents to campus when they're in high school still, and they're interviewing for the program, the, the, we give the parents forms to sign that say, if we make your son or daughter a scholarship offer and you turn us down to go to Duke or go to the other Ivies, 
that we can track them. And they all sign those. So we have a control group of students that by every metric we can come up with, GPA, SAT, stated interest in the program, desire to be a scientist, everything we can come up with, uh, they turn us down to go elsewhere. They graduate with similar high GPAs, but they're half as likely to be retained in STEM and seven times less likely to, com to complete a STEM PhD degree. And so we're constantly doing assessments, not only of our own students, but of, of those in the uh, other group. Now, this has had a huge impact on institutional climate. Uh, we started this program in 89. By 2005, we saw more than 400% increase in non-program African-American STEM degrees. Uh, ASBMB very shortly said we were the top school of origin of black bachelor's degrees in, um, in biochemistry. Uh, African-American STEM GPAs at graduation went from 2.7 to 3.2 in that time period. And again, we've published this. <clears throat> uh, and then the components of the Meyerhoff program that seem to be really working, we've tried to adapt them more broadly in our freshman and sophomore curricula across campus. By 2018, uh, UMBC African-American graduation rates equal or exceeded Caucasians in all majors, regardless of program. So the entire campus, not only the climate, but the outcomes has changed. I just want to give you a couple examples. This is Isaac Kinde. He's out in California now. He actually was raised in California and got into um, uh, Stanford uh, and turned Stanford down to come to UMBC. I should also point out Anwesha Day. She was a PhD student that he worked with. She's now a high-level scientist at Genentech, and she's the one that's, that is uh, working at Genentech to provide more uh, inclusive oppor opportunities there. Um, so he turned down Stanford to, and to come to UMBC. He ended. He worked in my lab, published a couple of papers, did his MD PhD with Bert Vogelstein. Uh, he co when he graduated, rather than doing a residency and going on into clinical work, he co-founded a company called Thrive Early Detection. He's basically come up with a way of detecting cancers in a uh, Pap smear. Uh, four different types of cancers. He's now moved his company to California. I think he's in the San Diego area. Uh, he was described in Forbes magazine as one of the top 30 under 30 to watch a few years ago. He's, he's basically revolutionizing healthcare for women. You've all probably seen Kismiki Corbett on television during the, the, during the COVID pandemic. She's the person who really led the effort at NIH to develop the Moderna COVID vaccine. Darian was a student of mine who did his PhD with Julie Fagan at UCLA. He's at Moderna who also worked on the vaccine. Uh, let me just um, uh, point out uh, Jerome Adams. You saw him on television. He was the US Surgeon General. Uh, was a Meyerhoff scholar. Uh, Sylvia Trent Adams is a uh, was a Meyerhoff scholar. We've had 40. Actually, now we're we're up to more than 55 tenured or tenure track faculty positions. This this was a slide I made a couple a few years ago, um, and these are our former Meyerhoff undergraduates who came to us as 17 year olds saying, "I want to be a scientist." Who now hold faculty positions around the country. Uh, right up here, this is Kafui Jirasa. He's at Duke, and he's now the first of our former Meyerhoffs who was just elected into um, uh, both the National Academy of Medicine, and he's also an HHMI investigator as of this past year. So they're all at, at pretty, many of them are pretty good places. Four of them are tenured or tenure track at Duke. We have a couple at Stanford, several at Johns Hopkins, and these are the other, others that are at Research One universities. Now, that's all. Everything I just talked about was our efforts with students at the undergraduate level. They've gone on to do PhDs or MD PhDs elsewhere, but our impact on them was at the undergraduate level. That's the Meyerhoff undergraduate program. I want to shift gears slightly because what we noticed as faculty is despite everything we were doing at the undergraduate level, starting in 1987, we were doing nothing at the graduate level. So these are URM PhDs awarded at UMBC. Uh, from 85 to 95. This is a binary chart. I mean, this is terrible. This is 0001, one PhD to a minority, 000011. And so this is where the faculty took a lead role. So it was me and some of my colleagues. Uh, I wrote a grant to the NIH called an IMSD grant to support diversification of the PhD program that was funded. 
Uh, and that allowed us to do lots of things for to try to build a better graduate program. Outreach is critical. And I can tell you this, before we started outreach, uh, just having the money and the, the reputation of Freeman and the undergraduate program was not enough. What we needed to do was bring in undergraduates from minority serving institutions, let them spend one summer at UMBC to learn about what it's like and to feel like they really are wanted here. And then, uh, you know, quite a few of them came. And if they didn't come, they went back with teacher t-shirts <laughs> talking about our program and other students from their schools would come. So outreach is critical. We also have a summer bridge. It's not like the undergrad bridge, because these are more mature students. Some of them have families. So we just get them involved in research, a technical writing course, and, and other things. We have monthly meetings where they speak, an annual retreat, student travel, and, um, and workshops. This is one of our retreats where we went out to Western Maryland and go whitewater rafting. Uh, we also like to go to Harper's Ferry. There's a lot of Black history in, in Harper's Ferry, and we do a big hike this was taken a few years ago with the Meyerhoff Graduate Fellows at Harper's Ferry. Uh, I like to go skiing, so we charter a bus and go up to Maine and go skiing for a weekend. Again, just a, an amazing group of people. So here's some of the numbers. When we started the program, we only had three students. Uh, they were all supported by this NIH grant. As the program started to grow, we could move some students off the NIH grant and onto other funding. And what happened is as the faculty started to buy in and see the value in the students, they would come to me and say, can you help us you know, recruit this particular student into our program? And sometimes I could say yes, and sometimes I'd say, well, I don't have the money, but I'll help you recruit them. They can be in our program. It's just that we can't provide their, their stipend. And so as of now, we typically bring in about I don't know, 18 to 20 new students per year, sometimes more of which we can support about 12 of them with a grant. And all the others are, their, their stipend comes from the programs, uh, but, they're, but they're part of our larger community. And what you can see is now we're over 100 students. So this is, by 2017, we, we hit 100 enrolled minority PhD students in our program. And these are degrees awarded. This is by 2015. I, I need to update this. These are more updated numbers. So in the six years prior to starting, I'm sorry, in the 10 years prior to starting this program, UMBC pr produced six minority PhDs, but we've had, uh, we had 142 from 2000 to 2020. And as of right now, we're at 187. Um, we've uh, had 84% re retention since inception. And uh, right now on our camp, this is as of 2020, and every fall we get back up to over 100. Right now we're a little lower because they graduate during the year, but as of the uh, as of September 1, we'll be back over 100 enrolled minority PhD students. So we've been considered a gold standard. Can it can what we do here be done at other institutions, particularly if they have like-minded leadership? Uh, and so I went to HHMI and asked them if they would support an experiment, and they did. And we decided to partner with UNC Chapel Hill and with Penn State University. You know, the problem is I would give a talk and people would say, you can do that because you have Freeman Hrabowski as your president, or you can do that because you're in a suburb of Baltimore. There was always some excuse why they couldn't do it. And so we decided to try these two places. They're very different. UMBC, at the time of starting the experiment, had 11,000 undergraduates, 34% minority, 17% African-American, suburb of Baltimore. UNC was larger, 18,000 undergrads, but half as diverse, with 16% minorities and only 8% Black. They uh, also have a medical school on their campus and a very poor history of inclusion. They only had four Black freshmen by 1960. Penn State, uh, is is even more different from UMBC. 41,000 undergraduates, even less diverse, 12% underrepresented, only 5% African-American. And yet, because they are so large, they're a top five school of origin of STEM PhD. So uh, over a 10-year period, according to the NSF, 193 PhDs students a year earned their bachelor's degrees originally from Penn State. Yet out of that 193, only four were African-American. And when we talked about doing this, their chief diversity officer said it would never work because they said parents won't trust us with their children. So both UNC and Penn State had issues. 
So we took a partnership approach where I there was immersive uh, mentoring at UMBC of their faculty and their and the, the leadership that they hired to run their programs. I spent time on their campuses I, in the dorms uh, uh, at UNC for a couple of weeks in particular. Uh, we have biweekly staff meetings. We had annual leadership meetings, regular ongoing formative assessment. We have our control groups of students in the program and outside the program so we can know what's working and what's not working. And so here are our outcomes. This is after the first uh, four years of the program, um, which we found is that STEM retention matched Meyerhoff. It's above 90% four-year graduation rates. This was the first year of the very first cohort of Meyerhoff. So after four years, we didn't have a very high graduation rate. It took six years to get most of our students out, but we learned. So by the present day cohort, the one that matches UNC and Penn State, we were up a lot higher after four years. But you can see because Penn State and UNC did the things we told them we that they should do, they equaled or exceeded our uh, graduation rates. Their GPAs, here's our first cohort, second cohort, third cohort, fourth, fourth cohort. You know, it took us a while to figure out how to do things at UMBC. Um, but here are UNC and Penn State in their very first cohort, their second, their third, their fourth. So again, they were able to get off to a very fast start because of this partnership. And here's the average GPA over the, the full lifetime of the Meyerhoff program. PhD matriculation. What you can see is UMBC, we had originally had quite a few MD students and UNC did as well. Penn State, their very first cohort were all PhD or MD PhDs and they were similar to the present day Meyerhoff cohort. And then minority participation, it started a little lower at UNC and Penn State, but it grew by year six to being quite close to the Meyerhoff diversity. Endowment, you know, people say, where do you get the money? Well, UNC, after only three years, raised $16 million. They built this into their capital campaign, just like Penn State did. Penn State raised $12 million in three years. I think UNC's endowment is now over $30 million. Uh, you know, it's just been a few years beyond that. So people care and they want to give to these kinds of programs. By comparison, we don't have the same large pool that they do our endowment right now it's uh, almost 30 million but um, you know we have not done as good a job as they have at, at raising money from their alums so there's a lot of outside interest i just thought i'd show you these are the millennium scholars that in 2016 this is at their president's dinner their president at the time is is back here this is at the president's mansion uh this just looks exactly like the meyerhoff program the the composition this is the Chancellor Science Scholars. Uh, Carol Folt is right here kind of in the front. Again, this looks just like the Meyerhoff program if you look at them. Carol uh, really took a had to take a big stand. I, I don't know if any of you remember, but um, they had a, a statue of a Confederate general on their campus. And when one of the UNC historians found in an old, old newspaper that this, con this Confederate general had bragged about whipping the clothes off the back of a Negro woman in the street because she was disrespectful. Obviously, the students got upset and they tore the statue down. Well, she was president at the time and she wanted to have the granite base of the statue removed. The state legislature said, no, it's part of our history. We're going to build a building around it and post guards and make it a monument. So uh, in the middle of the night, she had the statue, the base removed from campus. She sent a letter to the state saying that uh, I've had the statue base removed. I can be out of my office by the end of the semester if that's what you want. And they said, no, you can be out of your office by the end of the week. So she ended up uh, moving to uh, USC. She's the, the president at USC now. But still, that's the kind of effort and guts it takes to continue to do these kinds of things. And so we've expanded the partnership. We're now partnering with Berkeley. We've done, we've done, we've been working with Berkeley and UC San Diego. That's been funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And we're also working with Howard, even though it's a minority serving institution. And my old alma mater, a small place in Pensacola, has a phenomenal program in the panhandle uh, of Florida. So, um, so the conclusions that I would leave you with is that. Uh, yeah, we can have a bigger impact nationally than we are right now. The talent pool is there. Large numbers of minorities are starting in our colleges with an interest in STEM, and we're not retaining them. 
Uh, our program, yeah, we're cherry picking, but look at all the cherries that go unpicked. Uh, we've talked about the fact that, you know, your, your football team, your soccer team, all of your, your sports teams cherry pick. They go after the best high school athletes and, and they do community building to try to make them help them work together as a team to be the best they can be. Why don't we do this in science? Uh, yeah, there are high achievers. They, they will succeed without our support, but they're less likely to be retained in STEM. And I think that this approach is a, is a really important alternative to the traditional approach of, you know, you have a problem, so you, 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 you make faculty go to diversity training courses or, or, or Title IX courses. And there's just so much uh, evidence that these efforts uh, don't work in most cases. And so this is an approach that starts by saying, here's the data. Our institution has an issue. You know, I know you all know of examples where you don't think we have a problem, but look at the numbers. We have a problem. And if you show scientists data, then they're more likely to say, okay, I agree with you, we have a problem. What are we gonna do about it? And then you convince people to work together. Freeman took an approach that raises people up rather than assume everybody is, is defective and pushing people into a corner and then try to pull them back out. He's, he's took an, he took an approach designed to try to uh, lift people up. At the graduate level, the uh, application pool is growing steadily. Outreach is important. And I think because key decisions are made by faculty, this, is a, this aspect of diversification can be done almost without the administration. On our campus, it was all initiated and led by the faculty. Um, and that can be done that way, I think, at, at most places. And then in terms of replication, it's just having, uh, it can be done even at large, predominantly majority institutions, but you just have to have like-minded administrative and faculty leadership, and it can, it can be facilitated by partnerships. And with that, I'm happy to uh, stop sharing, and uh, I think, uh, hopefully, I've left enough time to uh, take questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that terrific and inspiring talk. So um, any uh, people would like to ask questions for a minute. So Lady Edos, go ahead, Lady. Thank you, Mike. I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for um, sharing this information with us and congratulations, many decades of hard work and uh, definitely seeing uh, the value of the program. I am interested in hearing more about uh, institutional supports so obviously the cohort model um, has been effective. Um, and, and here, you know, we, we want a couple of action, but we also want to make sure that we are, you know, you know, you, you talked a little bit about training and you talked a little bit about how just, you know, just only focusing on training is not gonna work. Can you talk a little bit about institutional supports at large, if that does include some awareness, um, other ways to upskill faculty in terms of culture and knowledge, but if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be appreciated. Sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily the best approach, and I'm not saying it's the right approach to use today. But I think because Freeman was one of a very small number of Black presidents of majority schools, he took an approach that was the one that I said. We didn't hire chief diversity officer. I didn't even know if they have it. Our, we only hired a chief diversity officer I don't know, maybe six years ago was the first time that happened. Um, his approach was to come to people like me and, and say, hey, Mike, look, at UMBC has a problem. And I think that this might be a way to solve it. Would you be able to have some students work in your lab? And I said, of course, I already have a black student in my lab. I'd be happy to take more. And so what happened is faculty like me would, where all of a sudden we would have these students walk in and say, I'd like to work for you. They were really well prepared. They had a CV. They, they knew about my research. They'd read a paper or two because they had been given that coaching. And then when they got in the lab, they did really well. And I wanted more students like them into my group. So the, and then and, and the, the, again, the biggest culture change I think across campus happened when faculty would go up and teach a large class and rather than having the minority students spread out in, in the back of the class and in the shadows and really not visible, they were right there in the front row asking questions, you know, communicating, um, and they changed expectations, not just of the faculty, but of everybody. So how do you get that to happen? And I think that's where the summer bridge is so important, and that's where it does take resources. So you have to have an administration that's, that is 
proactively looking at high schools to find talented students that you try to recruit. Okay. And so, and we, so what we do is we pay for PSAT scores and then we find those talented high school sophomores, bring them to campus for a day so that they're part of a group of a hundred students and their parents uh, learning about the, the Meyerhoff program. Now, a lot of them may want to go to med school, but we want those students too. But it's just, that's not what the Meyerhoff is about. So it so at the undergraduate level, I really do believe it's got to, it takes significant institutional support. And on our campus, it did not start with faculty training. It started with the president identifying like-minded faculty who he thought would be good mentors and then supporting those faculty like me and then making sure the students had the tools they need so they could get into research labs right away and start making a difference in the research labs. And what happened is the faculty, once they saw this, they said, I, I want to help out. I want to do more. So I raised money from HHMI and from the NIH. The chair of biology raised money from the NIH, a MARC grant he got. And faculty started going to the president saying, I want to do more. I want to help because, you know, you, you realize you're having an impact. That's a lot different from starting with the assumption that all faculty are poor mentors and we need to mentor them up. It's like approaching all the black students and saying, you know, we know that you've, you're at a disadvantage, so we're gonna put you through some remediation to help make you better, and this is for your own good. I mean, it, it doesn't work, it, it's the wrong message. And I think if you go to your faculty with that same approach, I, I personally think that's the wrong message. It's certainly not what Freeman did. Now we do need to be educated, and we do need to learn about implicit biases and things. So there need to be those kinds of educational tools. We did not have them when we started, but I do think that they're real. They need to be a really important part of what what you're doing today. Okay, thank you. So uh, Kevin Nichols, I'm to take. Hello, uh, great presentation, um, Mike. I appreciate Thanks, uh, a couple questions. One question I think you already answered. How you find your students? You said you pay for PSAT scores, and that's how you're able to locate them on the front end. Is that correct? That's how we uh, try to raise uh, awareness about the campus. But in the early days, Freeman himself would go to the high school sometimes, but our Meyerhoff leadership would also go to the high schools and talk to counselors and take brochures, and we have a website. So in the early days, there was a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one activities to, to raise awareness about the program. Freeman, in one of the very first cohorts, he drove to the University of Maryland, he drove to the Eastern Shore to meet with twins, two black kids who are twins, Ryan and Brian Turner, and had dinner with them at their house because they had decided to go to Duke, and he convinced them to come to UMBC. So in the early days, there was a lot of, of, of effort one-on-one -on -one by the administration, and by the, the, the first couple of people hired to try to, the staff to set up the Meyerhoff program. Now all the schools know about us. And so that work is done. And, the, and the, the counselors and the teachers take a lot of pride when their students get uh, scholarships and, and get into the Meyerhoff program. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Last question is, how do you envision the new recent affirmative action decision affecting your program with regards to your ability to raise money and uh, et cetera. Yeah, it's it's not affecting us at all. Um, there were earlier decisions that happened quite a while ago during the Clinton administration when affirmative action was kind of really, well, it was, it was scaled way, way back. There were a lot of lawsuits around the country that uh, got, did, got rid of affirmative action. California got rid of affirmative action, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so, <laughs> So many years ago, um, Freeman decided to open the program up to anybody who cares about inclusion in STEM and the importance of, of social justice in STEM. And it's, it's easy to make an argument that they need to go hand in hand. I mean, just look what happened in Tuskegee. Those were NIH funded experiments. And there were doctors that said, we need to stop and give everybody penicillin. And the NIH said, no, if you want the money, you need to keep doing these experiments because we really need to know how many people do end up with their kids with birth defects and things. So, so these are federal decisions made, you know, where, so, so there, need, there needs to be that kind of education along with education about how to be a good scientist and, and be ethical. 
And so there are, I'm, I, maybe I'm going off track now. What we, I, I don't remember the original question. No, I think you answered it. I just wanted to know how you thought uh, the recent Supreme Court decision would impact your work. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's not impacting us at all. And I don't think it will. Whenever I publish a paper that talks about inclusion, there, I always get letters from somebody that say, I need to be more upfront that this is also for white people, you know, and we're we're not being honest about it and making it sound like it's only for. Black. There's people out there that are watching, you know, everything we do. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt us. Yeah, and as you say, uh, affirmative action's been gone in that sense for University of California system for quite some time of the kind. So right. uh, Susan Tutukawa. Hi, Mike. Long time no see. Hi, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I was um, um, really struck by um, the idea of the intrusive support, and obviously we we don't have much access to undergraduates. We are looking more at at postdocs and faculty, and and I was struck by your story about Christy Poulin and and how people were were regarding her. What do you recommend in terms of, say, faculty level or postdoc level? Do you think that providing that intrusive support would be helpful? Um, because, you know, by your by your um, nice control group of students who didn't accept your program, you know, you can't just brule the field and have them come, right? Right. It 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 it. I, I really was struck by the word intrusive. So can you yeah. comment? Yeah, so at the undergraduate level, it really is intrusive. You, we can't do that at the graduate level and at the postdoc level. And you know, the, our summer bridge at the graduate level is, is much, much different. But basically I approach the students and say, I, have, I can raise the money, but this is your program. What, would, what should we do to make it better for the next generation that's coming in or for the next group of students that are coming in. So they really take ownership and it's, it's, these are things that, that they want to do at the undergrad level, we're telling them what you have to do. <laughs> so it's, it, it is a lot different, but I do think that there are a lot of things that can be done even in that more um, less intrusive spirit. So for example, faculty, can be encouraged to um, do things to help to, to, to help with outreach. Maybe you have a seminar series, a, a, a group of faculty who would be willing to go and give a talk at your local minority serving institutions on their science. And then they talk about research opportunities, you know, and they're on a list and that list gets distributed. Maybe they're willing to go with you, with your school when you go to Abercams. This is a huge meeting uh, where um, it's held every year. Uh, there are usually, I don't know, two to 4,000 Black students, mostly Black at Abercams. Uh, there's a SACNES meeting where there are mostly Hispanic students. Um, and they all these students are putting up posters and giving talks, and they need faculty to be judges and to stand by your poster and talk about research opportunities at, at Berkeley or at the California schools or you know, so there are there are things that they can do that would that would help them reach out. But the other thing is, if they go to a meeting and you know ninety percent of the people there are people of color, and they're interacting with them as judges, and it it it's different to talk about it than to be in the middle of it and to feel it. And so there are ways that, as leaders, you can get your faculty to become involved with students in environments where they're the minority, but they're there to try to help people. It, it's just a way of learning perspectives. You can give out books. There's a great book called Whistling Vivaldi that um, talks about uh, you know, how one African-American tries to feel more safe and comfortable walking down. Well, in the, in the title of the book, he whistles Vivaldi to, to try to put people around him at ease about who he is, right? So there are lots of, uh, there's literature like that that you can provide to people to help them. And that, that was a book that was given to me by a black postdoc. So he was trying to help me out. So I think that there are lots of different activities that you all can do um, to um, and do them together. You know, maybe if you have a black postdoc, the postdoc and the faculty member together 
go to these go to the NABRCAMS meeting or go together to an HBCU and visit for a day and talk about research opportunities and the kind of research you're doing. There, there's things like that that I think can be really constructive and positive. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Kelly first has been collecting some uh, chat questions. So Kelly, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, one um, one of our participants asked, um, can you please talk about how the UC Berkeley program is working, if you know? Yeah, so I'm really excited about the, uh, the, the Berkeley program. Um, I'm, the reason that I'm more optimistic about it than maybe most other places is because from my outside view looking in, there's already major uh, buy-in by the upper leadership. Um, your president or, or chancellor, I forgot what her title is, but she has bought in. The, the size of the cohort has grown faster than any of the other programs, including Meyerhoff. I think that their incoming cohort is gonna be 50 students already, and you're only in your fourth year, I believe. Um, in terms of representation, you have um, a, a good number of Hispanic students, so that's great. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was announced publicly, but uh, Jennifer Doudna has made a significant contribution of her Nobel Prize money to that program. I mean, if that isn't public yet, it should be or will be soon. Maybe, I, maybe I'm speaking out of line here, but this is what I was told from Mike Botchin and from, and from Jennifer. So um, I think that by all those metrics, uh, Berkeley has the opportunity to really do well. Now, where the numbers are still leave a lot to be improved, and I had a long meeting with Mike Botchin about this just last week, is the Black particip participation. And, um, you know, one of the things I hear from people in California is, well, you know, we, um, you know, the percentage of Blacks isn't quite as high as it is in other places. But actually, I had to remind them that the number of Blacks in California is greater than the number of Blacks in Mississippi. It's actually greater than the number of Blacks in Maryland and North Carolina combined, I believe. So you do have students there. It's a matter of what adjustments need to be made to, to get more African Americans involved. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm really optimistic about the buy-in, about the leadership, and about the growth of the program. In terms of Hispanic participation, it's phenomenal. In terms of Black participation, they're working on it. And I think that they have plans to try to do more things like what we do to try to um, grow those numbers. And the numbers are growing. It just started with one in their first year, and then maybe went to three, and then maybe they have five this year. But we'd like to see those numbers up more like 20 or 30 at least um, per cohort. Yes, we at Berkeley still have a long way to go. So I'll call on the last question, uh, Lane Jeffrey, and then we'll we'll wind up. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm wondering. You mentioned about in your you know students of people of color in your program doing better because of the you know the policies and the practices you put in place, but that that effect has also like uh, spread to the rest of the campus. My understanding is that that is, you know, part of the selling point of this program. We're putting tons of resources into a handful of students, but it's not, you know, we're we're not spending this money just for these students. We're, we're like learning how to do it with these students and then everybody else can share in the benefits of that. And I'm wondering, because your program is specifically STEM oriented, are you seeing those effects only um, spreading out through the STEM disciplines, or is this having effects in other non-STEM disciplines as well? Yeah, it's, it's had an effect in all, all the disciplines. So in the social sciences, there was a big donor that gave money. It's not a Meyerhoff-like program, but, it, but it's a program that focuses on, on excellence and inclusion. Um, and and I, one of the stats that I, that I think I had in this, one of the slides was that the graduation rates now are equal for blacks and whites across campus, period. You know, regardless of program, regardless of whether the student was in a program, regardless of major, it doesn't matter. The, G, the graduation rates are the same. And I don't think you'll find that at any other white school in, in the US, or at least not, uh, not, none that I'm aware of. 
So it really has had a much broader effect. In STEM, the effect was very fast. Uh, the uh, ASBMB reported that that we um, were producing more blacks who go on to earn uh, PhDs in in biochemistry, um, but those blacks were not uh, Meyerhoff scholars. So um, I'm sorry, I just told you the wrong thing. We were producing more black bachelor's degrees in biochemistry. That's what I meant to say. Those black bachelor's degrees. Those numbers were so high because of the impact we were having on non-program students. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I should say uh, one of the discussions we've had with uh, UC Berkeley with several of the deans there is, uh, of course, they have picked up on the fact that the uh, they need to increase the retention of the students who come into Berkeley from underrepresented minorities who want to continue and wash out of the uh, STEM programs. Yep, and, this, and getting them involved in research at early on after the first year is perhaps the most effective intervention one can make there. Yep. And although we, of course, don't admit undergraduates here, but we have a lot of undergraduates uh, working and research at the laboratory. And one of the problems, actually, just uh, we can provide a many more mentors for this if there's uh, money to support the undergraduates. And so that's where we, even at the undergraduate level, can have a significant impact. And we've talked to several of the deans about this. You're absolutely right, because they start self-identifying as a scientist right away. You know, even, even the high school students that come in over the summer from the inner city, they start, you know, being afraid to be there and they, they feel very uncomfortable. But by the end of the summer, they're part of a team and they self-identify as scientists. You're right. I, I should have emphasized that even more, Michael. The... Oh, yeah. So anyway, that's great. Uh, we need to give you some time off because you have another talk to give at 11 on our time and to your time on, on your science as put in the chat. So let me say, this is, this is uh, I, I'm uh, really, how should I say, I get to take credit for at least bringing you to this talk because it was wonderful. Uh, and uh, it was the best part of the National Academies meeting was that discussion, to be honest. Uh, and so uh, thanks very much. And uh, uh, we, uh, I think uh, a lot of us have learned a lot at this, uh, at this seminar. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.